and welcome. We've been talking about the electric field, and so I wanted to get to some practice problems. Just a quick recap of some of the things we've talked about lately. So first of all, this is Coulomb's law right here. I've done a screencast on that and how to think through using that equation. It's a little different than other equations, so it's worth thinking about that, specifically what happens with positive and negative numbers here. I do want to point out I have changed the subscript here. We can go ahead and call that Q0, which is going to be our small positive test charge. So if you have two charges, this equation right here governs the attraction or repulsion between them. And you can go ahead and take that and apply it to our definition of the electric field. So if you take a look over here at the electric field, by definition we're saying that is going to be the force that is experienced by a small positive test charge or small charge, really, divided by that charge's charge, essentially. And so what that means is this is going to actually work out to be independent of whatever this value is because this is also up here. Let me, let me show you what I'm talking about. So we're going to take this, substitute it all over here, and essentially you're going to have a Q0 up top in the numerator up here and a Q0 down below. So I'm arguing that this Q0 is kind of irrelevant in the equation although it depends on what version of the equation you're using, depending on what the problem gives you. I'll show you that in a moment. First off, let's go ahead. You see the blue circle here. We're going to sub it in where the arrow is going, and I'm going to take this Q0 over here in the denominator and make it its own fraction over here, 1 over Q0, and then this is Coulomb's Law that's in the parentheses here. If you continue with the problem, you notice that you can cancel out the Q0 values, and you end up with this version of the equation. So it turns out that we have two versions of the electric field that we can use. And I'm going to tell you the major strategy right now when you're working these problems. If the problem says something about force or newtons or something in that regard, like they give you the force or they ask for the force, you're almost certainly going to be working mainly with this equation here. And if the problem makes no mention of the force, you don't have to solve for it, you're not given it, you're almost certainly going to be using this equation down here. It's really that easy. All right, so let's go ahead and see how all of this works out. So I do have an example problem up here. It says the test charge of this value. So 1.23. Holy crap, what is this? This is micro, and so the symbol is pronounced mu, but it's microcoulombs is what we're saying. Coulombs are a unit of charge. Micro means 10 to the negative 6 power. So 1.23 microcoulombs is placed in an electric field with a field strength of 2.22 times 10 to the second newtons per coulombs. What will be the force that it experiences? All right, I've already given you the major strategy to use because you have two different equations. Remember I said if the problem mentions force, you're going to use this first equation that involves force. Or if the problem makes no mention of it, then go ahead and focus on this equation. So what do you think we're going to do? We're going to work with the equation that uses force. So we go ahead and start plugging in what we have. We're going to isolate for our unknown. I usually like to put a question mark by my unknowns. Isolate first. Plug in my numbers after everything is isolated and get your answer right here. So the electric force that a charge of 1.23 microcoulombs is going to experience is going to be this, 2.73 times 10 to the negative fourth newtons. So that's how you would go about doing problem 1a. And the B part says, what will be the direction of the force on the positive test charge if the direction of the electric field is to the right? And so the answer to this is going to be to the right as well. The force will be in the same direction as the field for a positive charge by definition. Let me explain through an analogy. This is like saying, what would be the force of gravity if the gravitational field on the surface of the Earth pointed down? Like at this point, it would be pointing down. At this point over here, it would be pointing in this direction. At this point, it would be pointing in this direction. It's always pointing towards the center of the Earth. And so if we're looking at this point right here, the gravitational field is pointing down. What's the direction of the force? Well, it's in the same direction. So it is also pointing down. Just like over here, we've got an electric field going to the right. What's the direction of the overall force on this positive charge? It's going to be to the right. Now there is one exception where this analogy does not hold because gravity only attracts. As far as we know, gravity only attracts. It doesn't repel. Over here, if this was a negative charge, then it would experience a force in the opposite direction of the direction that we would expect. 
So just keep that in mind and you're going to be fine. But that is an important concept that the direction of the field is going to be the overall direction of the force that is experienced by the small test charge. All right, let's continue. Okay, and so I have another problem for you, and it says a charge of 1.23 microcoulombs is placed at a zero point on a number line, so that's going to be our zero point. Another charge of 7.77 microcoulombs is over here, 6 centimeters away. What is the net electric field at a point halfway between them? So I want you to think about how you're going to approach this problem for a moment. All right, I'm going to give you a verbal roadmap here. So we are going to need to solve for the electric field from Q1 on P. So this P is just a point in space. It's not a charge itself. It is not a charge itself. It's just a point that we're picking in space. And we're saying, well, what's the electric field here as a result of these two significant charged objects? We're going to have to find out what the effect is, what the electric field is at this point P from this Q1 value and from the Q2 value, and then we're going to find out about their interaction and figure out which one is stronger. You can already guess, if you take a look at this, this is 1.23 microcoulombs. This over here is 7.77 microcoulombs. If you're guessing that the effect of Q2 is going to be greater than Q1, you are right. That's our verbal roadmap, but I'm also going to show this to you in a conceptual and picture-based roadmap. So you'll see what I mean in a moment. So this is our diagram that we had on our last page. I do want to talk about our key concept here. Remember that the direction of the electric field is the direction of the force that would be put on a small positive test charge in the area of the charge creating the electric field. Let's see how this is going to work out. So like I said, you're going to look at the electric field that is created by this significant charge over here to the left. And that we're going to label as the electric field on point P from 1. And we're going to do a math problem and solve that. We're also going to do the same thing for the second object over here, the electric field on point P from 2, and solve for that value. Then what we're going to do is sum up those two electric fields. Now notice I drew this vector to be greater than this vector because I'm already anticipating that there's going to be a greater electric field from Q2 than there will be from Q1, and it turns out that is, of course, the case. I want you to start anticipating, once I solve for this and once I solve for this, what am I going to do with those two vectors? Am I just going to add up their magnitudes? Think about it. If this is 5 and this is 3, is my answer going to be 8? Or is it going to be something else? So I want you to start thinking about that because that may be the toughest part of the problem. All right, and so if we continue with the problem, we take a look at this. We're going to break it down. And again, remember, we've got our charge here. We've got a distance involved. Do we have a force with our given equation or are we asked for a force? The answer is no. So don't use this version of the equation. Look at this version of the equation over here. We know what Coulomb's constant is. Normally, this is rounded off to 9.0, by the way. 9.0 times 10 to the 9th. And we know what our Q1 is, our R squared value. So all of that's left is just to plug in our numbers and solve. And we end up with the electric field at that point from 1 is equal to 1.23 times 10 to the 7th newtons per Coulomb. All right, and if we do the same thing for the second charge, then we can go ahead and plug in our numbers here. Note the number here is going to be larger, so we would expect that we would have a larger electric field created at that point from 2. We go ahead and plug in those values, and we end up with 7.76 times 10 to the 7th. And then it becomes a little more tricky. I want you to think about this. Now at this stage, we go back here, and remember, we've calculated this, we've calculated this. I said if this was 5 and this was 3, is our net or our overall electric field going to be 8? What do you think? The answer is no. We're not just going to add up these numbers blindly because they are vectors, right? So we are going to do something else. We're going to treat this as a negative direction. This is a positive direction, just like we would with, say, forces. And we're going to find the difference between those two values. And now positive and negative values in the second half of the problem are going to represent direction, which is different than what they represented at the beginning of the problem. So let me show you what I'm talking about. I'm going to add these two as the sum of the electric field vectors. 
but I'm going to make this one negative because I'm going to say, well, it's going in the negative direction over here. I want to emphasize that. So that's what I've done with these arrows right here. And it turns out that the confusion that you may be feeling is because Ben Franklin originally decided to call one type of charge positive, one type of charge negative, which has some benefit to it, but it also has a little bit of confusion because when we get to this problem, for instance, at the beginning of the problem, the sign positive here signifies the type of charge that we're dealing with. And down here, this being positive signifies something different. It means it's a vector that's pointing to the right, and this negative means it's a vector pointing to the left. As long as you understand that, it's not going to be a big deal. You can continue with the problem. You can learn how to do this. I just want to point it out that at the beginning of the problem, positive and negative actually means something different than towards the second half of the problem like you're seeing right now. So let's go ahead. We go ahead and plug in our numbers, and we end up with not the sum of the magnitudes, but the difference between those two numbers and the sign of the vector that's greater. In other words, this is a greater vector, so our answer will have that sign. It'll be negative 6.53 times 10 to the 7th newtons per coulomb. And that's it for our example of how to do linear electric field problems. I'm probably going to do more screencasts in this series so you can learn how to do more complex problems, such as problems that you would have, like, say, two dimensions that you would be working with, like in the x and the y axis. Maybe they are not in a line. They are in a triangle of these say three points that you're looking at so the principles are the same it's just working with vectors in two dimensions i hope this has been helpful and if i put up a link for another video hopefully you'll go on to watch that video too thank you for listening have a great day